Professor, you are so funny, ha ha ha. some quartz for the for a, a later on in the fetus we do this really neat experiment lucy look at you all dolled up where have you been yes well i just came back from the opera it was wonderful i was inspired by tj jin's novel for the love of annie dupree in it annie goes to the opera with her family it is rigoletto so i decided to go see it and it was wonderful I'm amazed that TJ wrote about the history of the 1890s and women's suffrage. Oh, wow, the opera. Well, you know that TJ, he's a self-styled philosopher, you know, but... Well, it seems like a break away from his science background. He brings out lots of points in the, in the love story there that uh, uh, really are scientific. Oh, yes. I suppose philosophy is a science even though it can be anyone's opinion. Okay, class, let's get back to work. Oh, oh not, not me. No, no, no. I mean, I will, let's get back to work on the physics. Okay, okay now Lucy's going to lay out the analysis with the isochoric formula. And then we're going to try to find the size of the water molecule at that high temperature and pressure. During the combustion for the 20 milliseconds, the pressure really goes high and the energy is released. And that's why the internal combustion engine works. But what hasn't been realized, and the reason I use this closed frame of reference, is that after it's all done, we end up with net less, a vacuum. Lucy, take it away. Here, the professor is using the isochoric equation for the constant volume of the chamber and solving for P2 pressure, that is, P2 equals P1 times T2 divided by T1. Using kilograms per square centimeter, 14.7 psi equals 1.0335122 kilograms per square centimeter. So, 893.59 divided by 19.72 degrees Celsius, then times 1033.51228 equals 46,832.4664 grams per square centimeter. This would be the pressure of one gram of water vapor at 893.59 degrees Celsius or 1640.462 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the expected empirically found result of 666.114 psi. The ratio of 666.114 and 1000 is 0.666114. 1 minus 0.666114 equals 0.333886. The professor does this because there is 828.33 centimeters of water vapor that at 67.5 degrees Fahrenheit would be at 12.1764951 psi, if you remember from page 138, is now occupying 1000 cubic centimeters of space in the chamber, for a very short while at 893.59 degrees Celsius. 
The professor is trying to find the size of the molecule of water at 893.59 degrees Celsius and 666.114 psi. This is 434.788 septillion and change is the number of molecules regardless of the temperature or pressure. 1000 cubic centimeters is 1 to the 30th picometers cubed. We divide that by 434.788 septillion and we get 2,299,966.36 picometers cubed. The cube root of the volume divided by 4 thirds pi gives the radius of 81.88 picometers and is a better value of the separation radius. In finding another solution to space occupied by a molecule other than electrons orbiting a nucleus in an excited state, is considering the molecule as a hard crystal, and observing the possible physics. It seems that a stable frame of reference is reasonable to consider in that the event is short duration, and that the chamber, other than the physical shock, did not change its volume substantially, for the duration of 20 milliseconds, that the temperature was 893.59 degrees Celsius. The temperature will again settle back to 67.5 degrees Fahrenheit and be a vacuum of 12.1764951 psi, compared to the ambient pressure of 14.7 pounds per square inch. Thus we have two stable parameters, the chamber at 1000 cubic centimeters and the number of molecules at 434.788967 septillion. We can then adjust the radius and shape to accommodate space, as indicated on page 136. So, the professor is reasonably pleased that our new heated and excited water molecule has a modulus that varies about a separation radius of 81.88 picometers or more precisely, the diameter of 163.76 picometers. The reason for the diameter is it can be used dimensionally as the width of a cube, as the molecule changes shape. If you reference slide 209 and 210 on page 136, you can draw the inference that the molecule is at some stage of being square to round in shape and changing rapidly as the energy wave resonates for a short while. But now back to that energy wave that is moving through these hot molecules. The surface area of our chamber on the inside is 567 square centimeters. One gram of water molecules is undergoing a thermal redistribution that is being reflected back by the chamber walls in all directions. Though the drawing shows a linear front-to-back wave this is only a concept drawing. The actual wave is 360 degrees spherical. The professor uses the value of 1 gram of water molecules, distributed over 567 square centimeters, with an energy wave echoing 1,618,459.856 times in 20 milliseconds. From page 147 we have 1.515878 to the minus 21 gram meters of energy per square centimeter per molecule. This seems small but that small weight is going to hit the walls of the chamber 1,618,459.856 times in oscillation in 20 milliseconds. 1,618,459.856 times 1.515878 to the minus 21 equals 2.4533879 to the minus 15 gram meters times 434.788967 septillion events equals 1,067,705,998.97 gram meters per square centimeter. Convert square centimeters to square inches. 
there are 6.4516 square centimeters to the square inch. This equals 6,881,960,422.9598 gram meters per square inch, which equals 15,172,125.631 psi, for a duration of only 20 milliseconds. The frequency would be 80.9229 MHz with a wavelength of 1.23574 to the minus 8 seconds or rather 1.2357 nanoseconds. Wow, this seems absurd, but knowing that mechanical waves sum, many waves cancel by opposing energy and never reach the walls of the chamber, and perhaps the empirically calculated value of 666.114 psi, is this sum. So let's start looking at the atom and molecule as hard crystals, where electrons come and go because of dark matter. So let's see the possible physics of quantum crystals and the energy that they produce. So the professor took another approach. He took one gram divided by 434.788967 septillion molecules for a weight of 2.2999 to the minus 24 grams, with each molecule producing a unique wave of that weight. 2.299 to the minus 24 times 1,618,459.856 echoes equals 3.7224 to the minus 18 grams. This then times 434.788967 septillion events equals 1,618,459.856 grams. Convert to square inches for 10,441,655.606 grams or 23,019.91 pounds. This would seem to be another absurd amount of pressure. This is the instantaneous flash heat and pressure as the energy of 869.577315 sextillion electrons leave the chamber into the walls of metal. Another pass through the perihelion and the professor says he will retract this later. The flash energy just calculated is what an internal combustion engine uses. All the rest is discarded as lost heat. In this example, 10 degrees before the piston reaches the top of the cylinder is called the dwell angle. Somewhere in this time period the spark plug fires. At a thousand revolutions per minute this is 0 0.0055 seconds or 5.5 milliseconds, the burn duration of thousands of degrees and thousands of pounds of pressure happens in 20 milliseconds like our experiment. Again it is important to note that 0.15571229.5 grams and 0.207224 cubic centimeters is the lost mass, that is weight and volume. With the conventional model of atomic structure the science world says that the two hydrogen atoms adopt two valence electrons of the oxygen and abandon their own electrons. As was stated on page 143, the published value of the mass of the electron is 9.109 to the minus 31 kilograms or 9.109 to the minus 28 grams. If that is correct, then the quantity of 869.577315 septillion electrons weighs 0 0.000792 and change grams leaving 0.15492 grams which is not even a dent in our missing grams. The way that is missing even greatly exceeds our hydrogen total of 0.0147122 grams. The spatial disparity is large also, at 0.207244 cubic centimeters. So, to put into perspective, 
2.207244 cubic centimeters is 2.07244 to the 29th cubic picometers. If 0.014712 grams is divided by 2.07244 to the 29th, each picometer accounts for 7.098975 to the minus 32 grams. Now there are no exacting calculations in quantum mechanics, only generalities. So in this process I'm showing that the electron's mass is not the solution to the weight and volume that we've lost. A hydrogen atom with a radius of 31 picometers with its electron attached is approximately 124,788.248 cubic picometers. The proton only occupies 0.0287, or 2.87% of the volume, and the proton is only 9.5 picometers. I think our amazing hydrogen is a puffed up balloon, and its single proton is dimensionally near dark matter such that its radius is a focused resonance or oscillation, and because of dark matter impact measures 31 picometers at minus 423.182 degrees Fahrenheit or 20.2711 degrees Kelvin. At 20.2711 degrees Kelvin and 14.7 psi, one mole of hydrogen at 1.008 grams occupies 14.19 cubic centimeters. One cubic centimeter when warmed to 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 294.26 degrees Kelvin, expands to 12.0389 liters, and every centimeter contain. Please note, the expansion ratio is 1 to 848. 6.0221407.6 to the 24th divided by 14.19 hypercalculated equals 424.393 septillion divided by 12038.99 hypercal equals 35.234 sextillion atoms per cubic centimeter at 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 294.26 degrees Kelvin. 1.0 to the 30th divided by 35.234 sextillion atoms equals 28,381,397,710 picometers volume for each atom. The cube root of 28.3813971 billion. Hypercalc equals 3050.314317 picometers width of a cube, but also the diameter of a sphere. This would give a radius of 1525.15 hypercalc picometers. If recomputed using the volume of a sphere of 4 thirds pi times the radius cubed equals the volume, you can see the discrepancy. 4.18879 times the cube of 1525.157 hypercalc equals 14,860,465,091.182, compared to 28,381,397,710. So, the professor states, if you pull away from the vaporous magic of electron spin and mass attraction, and begin to see the problems associated with real and not imagined hard crystals as elements, the reality of slides 209 and 210 on page 136 become applicable. Using the empirical value of 31 picometers of compressed cubes of hydrogen near the solid stage at 20.2711 Kelvin we have 4.195898 octillion atoms per cubic centimeter. At 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 294.26 Kelvin there are 348.525584 sextillion atoms per cubic centimeter for 2,869,229,818 cubic picometers of volume of each atom. 
The cube root is 1420.9815699 hypercalc or 710.4907849 picometers radius. 1 cubic centimeter of liquid hydrogen becomes 848 cubic centimeters at 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 21.1 degrees Celsius at 14.7 psi or 101,352.932 pascals. Thank you, Lucy. Oh, 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 oh. That looks good, that looks good, that looks good. Well, what, it, what I'm doing is I'm cutting and polishing some natural quartz for this, uh, this big experiment that I do towards the end of the treatise. So I actually generate electricity from dark matter. So at any rate, uh, to continue on with our new view, a new view of the center of the atom and molecule. And that new view, that new view is that the, the proton, neutron, the core of the atom is hard and it's small and it's real close to the dimension of dark matter. Dark matter vectors because of the proton and the neutron. Well, we're going to get away from proton neutron because it's all the same stuff in the center. Layers and layers of hard crystal. And what we'll find is that the weight of the atom is proportional to its vector field. And then what happens when two protons of the hydrogen collide with the oxygen? Half its vector field is gone. It's embedded in the oxygen. Now the vector field and the weight produced by the collision of dark matter is where the weight difference comes when you take the hydrogen and the oxygen and combine them together into water. The mass goes down, the weight goes down, and so does the vector field. Now Lucy's going to give you a few more details and then we're going to do a summation of combustion part one. The new view the professor is presenting is all protons are hard and dark matter is vectored by its mass relationship to the volumetric size of the proton. Since gravity is not a magic attractive force but collision vectors, atomic particles have weight determined by their susceptibility to collision. The weight of the atom is proportional to its vector field. When the hydrogen protons slam into the oxygen their vector fields are gone, and they are buried in the oxygen. Likewise the oxygen's vector field is changed. The two hydrogen protons make it lopsided and warped, and thus its collision vector with dark matter, and it now being a molecule of water gives it the values we see. Electrons are not a measurable entity because they evaporate as waves into dark matter. The new entity water is not compressible once coalesced or precipitated, but it can exist as an expandable vapor. It is either a floating molecule at just above 4 degrees Celsius and weighs 2.299968 to the minus 24 grams approximately, and is uncompressible expanded with a radius dependent on its energy value in degrees, F, C, or K, semi-solid as ice expanding from 0.9998 grams per cubic centimeter, to 0.9167 grams per cubic centimeter below zero Celsius, and again contracting to 0.934 grams per cubic centimeter at minus 180 degrees Celsius or, 93.15 degrees Kelvin. Thus, attempting to place a weight value on the electron is invalid, and saying that the hydrogen atom shed its electrons, and that is where the weight and volume went is invalid, because of the misobservation of gravity. Electrons are wave focal points of dark matter collisions that only exist for short periods which the professor will show later. Thus looking for the missing point 1557122295 grams is invalid since mass attraction is invalid. What is valid is the new compound of water now produces a vector field that weighs 1 gram per cubic centimeter, when the entities of hydrogen and oxygen occupied 1.207244 cubic centimeters before combustion. 
The volume decrease is directly related to the electron vector field leaving, and compares to the 2.87% of space occupied by the proton as shown in slide 216.1 on page 151. 97.13% of space in the atom is the dark matter vector field caused by the proton. As seen in slide 216.3 on page 152, 2.87% of the atom's volume or 1.435% of each atom is gone, as the hydrogen is shaded from dark matter collision by the oxygen. So here is water. It is now visible, and you can drink it. It is the most linkable compound that exists because it will combine, dissolve, and bond with almost every element in the periodic table of elements which is why they call it a solvent, because the very mobile hydrogen proton knows no allegiance. It will dash off to another element it likes better, and leave the oxygen combined with almost every element known. So, what is the point to all of this? The point is that heat, which is the energy state of the molecule, is organized in three-dimensional space. If you alter the volume, the heat energy will rise temporarily and dissipate entropically into the surrounding space or materials. Combustion is matter colliding, smashing together, combining, increasing in density, thus reducing its size and space. The heat energy it had before it condensed is redistributed into the surrounding space. This heat energy caused all the other gases to expand as their molecules became more energetic as is seen with gay Lussac's law. The point is that an explosion is the reaction to the action which is implosion. This describes the universe as skewed dilation. Two things are happening, mass is increasing and the universe is expanding at the same time, and heat is molecules in motion, not flying around, but changing spatial size. This is energy. It does not exist except that matter possesses it. The idea of energy independent from matter as pure energy is a misobservation. We looked at this as a simple combustion consideration. Now, look at it in the large-scale reordering of matter through time. The first large reordering is when hydrogen is coalesced and created out of dark matter in the nebula. It is next compressed on the surface of a star like the Sun and is fused into helium. The dimensional change causes such a large reordering in space that the shock wave, which is radiance in a broad spectrum of frequencies, is so powerful that it heats the Earth 93 million miles away. The radiance of frequencies was transmitted not through empty space but through the massive dark matter presence which is bombarding us from all directions, which is the cause of the fusion on the surface of the Sun. It is pressure and not a magic attractive force of gravity or space-time dilation. So massive is the target of the Sun and the compression so great, that the only thing that escapes is radiance, and of course plasma which is energy waves in dark matter. The masses of stars continue to compress elements to create all of the elements in the universe. These elements are matter so compressed that their decay, or evaporation takes millions of years. It might be beneficial as the professor stated before, to look upon elements that are in solid form as being frozen. Their very high melting points can be seen as their natural liquid state inside of a star. Elements we experience in a gaseous state are an unnatural state, once they have been released from the pressure of the star. Elements are decaying or you might say evaporating, and over very long periods of time they decay to oblivion or back to dark matter. The elements we experience here on Earth, or on other terrestrial bodies, have escaped a star due to a collision that knocked them away from the star's mass. Humankind has learned how to take some of the heavy elements and refine them and concentrate them till their mass is so heavy that they are unstable. That is because they can only be maintained in their natural environment which is inside a star. The elements such as uranium and plutonium are decaying and if you get too much of it close together, 
It is called a critical mass. The atoms are decaying so rapidly that they begin to fly apart in a chain reaction, and you get a nuclear fission explosion. It is likely that the Earth and most of our planets are pieces of a star. The massive core of the Earth is of molten iron and could only be created in the belly of a star. Perhaps the Earth was a star. So this brings us to the close of episode 12. In the next episode, episode 13, we're going to take a look at carbon, the essential for life. And we're going to look at that method of metabolism and the way carbon produces the energy in our body. And then we're going to start into combustion part two.